appear that Dave is doing well, and I'm sure that we're all praying for his speedy recovery. But um, in the meantime, I'll be preaching for a while, so I hope that you all enjoy my sermon today and keep your mind to You know, before I started preaching, uh, long before I even thought of preaching, David came to me uh, one day and he said, depending based on what I've spoken at the table, that perhaps I might be good at preaching. In case you don't know, it's quite a difference from maybe less than a minute on the table to a 30 minute sermon. It's quite the job. And so, in my mind, I had some doubts, some fears, and that's all normal. For many people, public speaking, much more preaching for 30 minutes, is quite a big task, and it's hard for many people. And it's hard, of course. It's like when you look at a professional athlete, uh, a TV, or even a public speaker, and you think, I can do that. Seems easy enough. It's not very enough. You disregard all the practice they put in, all the hard work they put in, and you can't see that. And of course, it's hard to speak. Uh, but I make no excuse for that. Uh, for me, it was sin not to preach. You see, when God gives a commandment, He does not give a time frame. He does not say, a week from now you do this, or a year from now go and do this. No, he speaks in the present tense. He says, here and now, do this now. And so, that was in my conscience. Do this now. And there were, when there was a need for me to preach, somebody had to answer the call. When there was a need, somebody had to answer the call. Today, there are many men that need to answer that call. They live in evil times. There ought to be more Christian men that God preach the gospel where truth is very hard to find nowadays. And so I stand before you to preach a very important lesson, I feel, the awfulness of sin. I was reading an article about an old-time preacher. He was supposedly considered to others a walking, talking, living Bible. And he said, I don't think I've ever had a successful sermon or lesson on this very topic, awfulness of sin. He felt by manner of speech and words and grammar that he could not lead a successful sermon on the awfulness of sin. Now, I don't think I can best him and somehow in a single sermon show you the awfulness of sin and somehow prove this point. No, I'm not here to do that today. Uh, I don't think anyone can though. I do not think a single person on earth could in one sermon show you all the awfulness of sin. Because the consequence of sin is unimaginable. Suffering and the eternal suffering of sin, the consequence of that sin is unimaginable. And so nobody can lead a sermon to show you the full extent of the awfulness of sin. By the traditions of the Catholic and the Orthodox Church, they said that Lazarus, uh, the one who Jesus raised from the dead after he was buried for four days, they said that in those four days, Lazarus saw hell. Now, I don't know if this is you know, correct, but we'll, for the purposes of the illustration, we'll assume that it is correct. They say, after Jesus raised him from the dead, after he was dead for four days, that he never smiled again. For 30 years that he was alive, he never smiled again. Not so much as Latin. Because what he saw was so detrimental that he could not bring himself to smile again. And I feel for, I cannot illustrate that point enough that I cannot show you a tiny box photo or picture or artwork that will make you look at it and be not able to smile for the rest of your life. It's not possible. So that is not the point I'm trying to make. But the point is, is that the consequence is unimaginable. I think the 
way to illustrate this is that of what we think of suffering, we put it in human terms, ways that we can comprehend. But I do not believe the suffering of hell can be comprehended in human terms. The question I ask to, uh, a common question actually is, can you imagine a new color? It's not possible. You can't think of a new color in your head. You cannot think of a color that you have not seen. And so the suffering of hell is so detrimental that you cannot put it in human terms. And I feel for many people that they will not truly understand the awfulness of sin until they see its consequence. And so they are physically there and they are judged. So today I am going to show you how God reacts to sin, how what sin really means. Many individuals do not realize the true awfulness of sin because of man's refusal to label sin as sin. Often it is sugar to think that, even ignore it. Yet sin is labeled as transgression and iniquity against God. The failure to call out and rebuke sin has allowed sin to reign throughout society and the church. Do people not realize the awfulness of sin? Various times in the Old Testament, the result of man forgetting God and following, and following what is right in their own eyes has led to destruction. After the times they became free from tribulation, they had forgotten the awfulness of sin. And I bring up this point because today, the reason people do not realize the awfulness of sin is because they've forgotten God. They've forgotten the consequence of sin. And so I bring this point. And Psalm 9 verses 15 and 17. It says, The heathen are sunk down in the pit they made, and the net which they did is, is their own foot taken. The wicked shall be turned to hell, and all the nations have to take God. Some people raised the question uh, regarding Sodom and Gomorrah. They said, What God did to Sodom and Gomorrah, and how he destroyed it, how he utterly destroyed it, what would he do to the United States? And I can't answer that question. I don't know. He could, if he wanted to, destroy it. In hellfire, storms, whatever he could imagine. But I don't think, at least in my own belief, that God would destroy it in this sense. Rather, I believe that the sin in itself would destroy the nation. If sin is allowed to run rampant in the nation, the nation would destroy itself. You can look at an individual starting with one sin, and see how the sin progresses. And the sin does not, does not exactly hurt others, but it hurts themselves. And you can see that. What would become of society, more of the church, if they had forgotten the awfulness of sin? Uh, here is Moses' warning. In Deuteronomy, you will find perhaps what I think is one of the most important moments that Moses had in the mind. Because what he said to the Israelites would determine whether that nation would prosper or if it would be utterly destroyed. And so I'm going to turn to that. And I wish that you would all turn to that with me as well. That is Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1 through 20. All the commandments which I command thee, command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. That is, if you keep my commandments, ye will be you will prosper. I will bless you. And thou shalt remember all the way which all the way which the Lord thy God let these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thy heart, whether thou would keep his commandments. Or no. I believe today can be likened to that. The earth is just that, a proving ground. Whether we will keep the commandments of God or not. And so let's continue to read this. It says, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with men, which thou knewest not, neither did thy father know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment wax not hold upon thee, 
I did my foot swell in these 40 years. And so you see how God takes care of his children. Those who follow his word will be taken care of. And though, as these people suffered, God cared for them, nevertheless. Man. He says, Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. And God, as that perfect Father, chasteneth us. When we do not abide in his word, we will be punished. Therefore, thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, fountains, and depths that spring out of their valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, and vines and fig trees, pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarcity. Thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig grass. When thou hast eaten and art full, then shalt thou shalt bless the Lord thy God, for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God, and not keeping his commandments, and his judgments, and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Blessed when thou hast eaten and art full, and hast built goodly houses, dwell therein, and when thy herd and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold multiply, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thy heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, where there were fiery serpents, and scorpions, and drought, where there was no water who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flame, who fed thee in the wilderness, manna, which thy father knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do good, be good at thy latter end. And thou saying in thy heart, My power and the might of mine hath, me, hath hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is given, it is he that hath given the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy followers, as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them, I testify against you this day, that ye shall surely perish. And the nations which the Lord destroy before your face, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. And you see that there is consequences, and there is benefit to serving God. Um, I would say it's an accurate comparison from the land that, that God speaks of them to heaven. That is our Israel. It is heaven. And if we set our eyes on the mark, we can have it. It could not be any clearer. Those who oppose God and walk against them will not prevail. God rewards and cares for those who will do His will. Joshua, Joshua also gives a similar warning, and Joshua, Joshua verse, uh, yeah, chapter 24, verse 20 says, "If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then He will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that, He hath done you good." And verses 14 and 15 says, "Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him." Sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you, serve the Lord. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Are the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, whose lands ye dwell? But as for me, my house, they will serve the Lord. Moses, Moses clearly knew the repercussions of forgetting God. His own sin denied him access to the promised land. To forget God and destruction. To look at the great flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, the destruction of Jerusalem, the period of judges. The very same destruction can happen today. Yet people do not realize the awfulness of sin. I think you can look throughout any part of the Old Testament and you can see the repercussions of sin. And I feel many people forget to look. Forget to look in the Old Testament to see how God reacted to sin. 
see how unacceptable it was. That it was not something as simple to just look aside at, but something that needs to be reviewed, something that needs to be answered for. Sin is defined as transgression and iniquity against God. First John chapter 3, verse 4. This whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law. For sin is like a transgression of the law. And so we cannot find any other definition for sin. Is sin is sin. It is a transgression against God. As soon as we start to sugarcoat it and approach it from a different manner, it's just simple weakness and something that can be ignored, especially in the church. We fall short. We do not realize what we're doing. Because any sin and all sin is transgression and iniquity against God. Sin is the root cause of all problems in the world. All crime and disease would not be so if there were no sin. One can clearly see the awfulness of sin by this fact. Every death is because of sin and every war, murder, and atrocity is from sin. The effect of sin is a lack of humanity and morality. The world clearly needs to realize the awfulness of sin. So when we look at the world today, when we see things that we would used to think would be impossible, that people would allow, we find that the root of it is sin. That at a point, conscience is seared to such a manner in sin that there's no feeling left at all. That they don't realize what they're doing. The only way that the world today can know what they're truly doing is by realizing this fact the awfulness of sin, the consequence of sin. And I'm sure that we all have a job, a job to preach to people, that they may know that extent of that. Here you will find that in the Old Testament, the price of sin was death. You would not find it imaginable today that, that such was the consequence of sin, that a simple sin was worthy of death. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 and 19, he says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I command thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou eat bread, for thou return unto the ground, for out of it was taken for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And here you will find that the price was actually death. It was quite a thing that I don't think anyone would imagine today of being disobedient to their parents. The, the price of death. It was that serious that such a sin was worthy of it. Even that of homosexuality was homosexuality was to be put to death. It was it was severe. And we need to realize that's very. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18 through 21, it says, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father, or the voice of his mother, and that, when they have, have chastened him, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him, and bring him out unto the elders of this of his city, and to the gate of this place. And they shall say unto the elders of this city, of his city, this, our son, is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of this city shall stone him with stones that he died. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Something to realize is that God is immutable. That is, he's an unchanging God. And had Jesus not died on that cross, we would all be worthy of that same death. If someone had not paid the price of our sin, we would be worthy of that death. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, it says, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed sin, committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. 
Because of the price of sin, Christ went to Calvary to be crucified, unenduring pain, suffering, and mockery. Hebrews 9, verses uh, 11 and 14 says, But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a rare and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of the wolves and the goats, of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself, without spot to God, purge your conscience con con from dead words, serve the living God. Have we witnessed and understand the true magnitude of the price of sin and its offerings? When we take sin lightly, we take Christ's sacrifice lightly. And here I bring a very, perhaps maybe off topic, but I think it's very important. That is to understand how God reacts to sin. And it's the sin of improper worship. And it's probably one of the most prevalent and dangerous sins, I think, that people will choose to deceive others. As we have talked about in Bible studies, uh, how can these people go to sleep, knowing that they have deceived others, and they have deceived themselves. And I don't know. It's, I would say it's a seared conscience. And to really usher the importance of the, the sin of improper worship, we ought to look at one of the very first sins you see in the Bible. And that is the story of Cain and Abel. I think this is a great example of acceptable worship and an unacceptable worship. In the story of Cain and Abel, one of the very first sins we witness in the Bible is the sin of the improper worship. Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 and 8 was in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought up the first thing of his flock from the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Abel, Why art thou wroth, and why is thou countenance fell? Call me. Thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin might at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, and they were in the fields, that Cain rose up against Abel and slew his brother. Now, in the conscience of Cain, I'm sure that he had no ill intentions, perhaps, in his offering. He wanted to offer a sacrifice unto the Lord. And then, I'm sure some people <coughs> may have no evil in their mind when they go and go against the Lord unknown for perhaps but Cain was given the proper example of sacrifice. And so though he had, had no maybe no ill intentions, there was still an acceptable and unacceptable sacrifice. And Cain did not offer that acceptable sacrifice. He did not offer a blood sacrifice. And it was not acceptable to God. Though he may not have had, had ill intentions, it was not acceptable unto God. And I feel you ought to realize that in the church, though we may not mean any ill to perhaps have a, a music, a band, or whatever, it is not acceptable unto God. Though we have no ill, we want something enjoyable to keep with our ears. It's not acceptable unto God. It is sin, transgression, and iniquity against God. In this story, we learn two things. There is a proper way acceptable to the Lord in worship, and an unacceptable way of worship. If God did not accept Cain's day of offering because he offered what was not authorized, what makes us think God will accept a worship that he did not authorize? Though not mentioned in the time, it is clear that God wanted a blood sacrifice. The thought process of Cain would be like how many others today. He did not say we, didn't, we couldn't use slash have how wrong these individuals are. If we do not do what God authorizes, we cannot expect he will accept our worship. 
to not add or take away from one of my commandments. I want to pertain to uh, back to how those deceived people I feel pretty today when they have read a Bible and they just have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and they go out to be baptized. It is not so easy to just go out to the next door church down the street and expect that they will teach everything and only the truth and that is the word of God. I think it's sad how hard it is to come by the truth and that people sometimes feel that they have to compromise. That is, they have to find a church where they think, well, it's not total truth, but it's close enough. And you'll find that close enough isn't acceptable to God. He wants nothing but the whole truth. And if it's not acceptable to God, it not, should not be acceptable to us. So it seems today that truth has to be sought, has to be found. And if we all respected the Word of God as it was, as it is, the Word of God, there would be no division. Every church would teach the same thing. But it seems that they don't know the awfulness of sin. Nadab and Abihu, the Bible, too, were guilty of improper worship. They were killed in the very same moment by God. In Leviticus 10, verse 1 through 2, it says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire there, put incense there, thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them. They died before the Lord. If people would not see the awfulness of sin, Sin begat more sin. This was very clear in the story of Cain and Abel. He went, offered an unacceptable sacrifice. He slew Abel, slew, slew Abel, and then he lied. You see how that progression occurs. It occurs in a lot of people. Uh, you see in how corruption sin occurs. Perhaps you see a very small sin in somebody, and then slowly, though you may not realize it, comes more more, more, and more. And then, soon, you don't even recognize the same person. It's a very sad thing, but such is the, the nature of sin. That is that, corruption. Sin will not wither away with time. Sin cannot be ignored. Sin will not cease to be prevalent until individuals realize the awfulness of sin. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Thou doest well, shall that not be accepted? And thou doest not well, sin like the door, as it thee shall be desired. And thou shalt rule over it. And Cain talked to Abel his brother, and came to pass. And they were in the field. And Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and slew And the Lord said unto, unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. This, this is a common phenomenon of Satan. It says, Know ye not that to whom ye you yield yourselves servants to obey, the servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness? Jesus answered unto him, saying, Very, verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 18 through 20, it says, For many walk of whom I have told you often. And here we find, uh, specifically in the church, that sin should not be acceptable. Yeah. It likens it unto leaven. A little bit of leaven, leaven is the whole lump, a whole piece of bread. And you find any sort of sin in the church, it should quickly be sharply rebuked. Because the way sin works is that it has been likened to it's a, can it's a cancer, it's a sickness, and perhaps the most contagious sickness. If it is allowed to be and to dwell, it will fester and it will consume. Because for many, and Paul writes here, he's, he's crying based on that very fact. He knows that that's how the nature of sin. And so he cries over this fact. Demonstrates his love and care to the church. That he writes these things weeping. 
Because for many of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence we also look from all, whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Sin moves at an astounding rate, both spreading and consuming. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Ye did run well, who did injure you, that ye should not obey the truth? This per- persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And sin is blinding. As feel many people, they do not realize that, that they are perhaps in sin. Because the devil is a liar. And today, many, many good things are called evil. And so, and you do not even realize that they are an evil. It's the uh, same thing with abortion. It's called pro-choice. You hear choice, and that's a good word. And it's, it's a, an illusion. It's, it's uh, seeking people. And I feel people are blinded when they see that. And they are told that good is evil, evil is good. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving to seducing spirits and doctrines of heaven, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscious seared with a hot iron. In John chapter 3, verse 19 and 21, it says, And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, and that cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. The current predicament facing our world today is exactly that, a blindness to sin, a conscience that does not feel, a mind easily deceived, and a labeling of evil as good and good as evil have all been great cause for it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, it says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the mind of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should not shine unto them. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, it reads, Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the light of God, through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves unto the lavish to work all in cleanliness of greediness. If we are not careful, we can enter a state of blindness. I think you might wonder how you might see a very well-off Christian and think perhaps they're, you know, you would not expect them to just wait from the truth. And there are cases where they do. And we think to ourselves that it cannot occur with me, it cannot happen to me. But it can. We ought to be watchful for that. That we do not fall into sin. That we do not fall into blindness. To a point where we do not even recognize ourselves. Regardless of the labels the world uses for sin, and its normalization of sin, the words of God remain the same. This is our beginning uh, verse that I had. It says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And so we cannot lie to ourselves, and neither can any church lie to their members. That despite their sin, that is, that is if they continue in sin, that God will allow them. He will make an exception. God does not make exceptions. Here we have truth revealed. These people will not inherit the kingdom of God. It is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So as God shows the people, you ought to live worthy of that call. 
In Luke chapter 16, verse 27 and 31, it says, Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send them to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify to them, lest they also come into this place of point. Abraham saith unto them, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. He said, Nay, Father Abraham. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, unto him, They hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. This is uh, the rich man, and the story of uh, rich man, the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man had been in hell. So he, he asked Abraham if they can go, go from the dead, and warn, warn people. But you see, that even though one would rise from the dead, it's not, they said that they would not be convinced. Same thing with the Pharisees. Though they saw the miracles of Christ, though they saw the good things He did, they were not convinced. And so I feel today that though you might tell someone to go to a certain location at a certain time, that under their feet will perhaps be a miracle of some kind, that they will make excuses, they will not accept it. Because sin is that blinding, that they don't want to accept it despite it being so clear. And it's proven right here in the story that it's confirmed that despite them witnessing these things, they do not want to accept the truth. No matter how clear it may be, with lost window or such, they will not accept it. And this is from the Adam Clark commentary um, that was very good. And so I put it here. And he says, And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. This answer of Abraham contains two remarkable propositions. One, that the sacred writings contain such proof of a divine origin that though all the dead were to arise, to convince an unbeliever of the truths therein declared, to convince the conviction could not be greater, nor the proof more evident of the divinity and truth of these sacred records than that which themselves afford. Two, that to escape eternal perdition, to get at last into eternal glory, and man is to receive the testimony of God and walk according to their, di- to their dictates. And these two things show the sufficiency, perfection of sacred writings. What influence could the personal appearance of the Spirit have on an unbelieving, oppressive heart? None, except to testify for testify it for the moment, and afterward to leave it ten thousand reasons for uncertainty and doubt. Christ caused this to be exemplified in the most literal manner by raising Lazarus from the dead, and did this convince the unbelieving Jews? No, they were much more, so much the more enraged, and from that moment inspired both the death of Lazarus and of Christ. Faith is satisfied with such proof as God is pleased to afford. And sin distorts the truth. This is why it's so hard to find the truth today. Find people who are self-willed and not God-oriented, not God-willed. And then they live unto themselves and they not only live in their sins, but encourage it unto others. And you will not find the truth in there in their church. But you will find their own doctrine. In John chapter 8, verse 42 and 47, it says, And Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word, ye of what are of your father the devil, the lust of, of, of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and both not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you of you convinced me of truth of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not do ye not believe me? He that is of God hears God's word. Ye therefore hear not them not, hear them not, that ye are not of God. Many today, or I think there are two lives that were taught. They 
perhaps in the, I think if one is scientific, they would not be a believer of God. Some feel they're too smart for God, and they're too wise and beyond religion. And so, the reading here it says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image to make life to corruptible man and to birds and four footed beasts and creeping things. For for God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the loss of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worship and serve the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 and 23, it says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, put bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. Well unto them that are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. And unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to make a strong drink, which, just, which justify the wicked for reward, and take away the righteous, the righteous, the righteous from them. And I don't think I could lead a sermon on the offense of sin without mentioning the consequence of sin, that is hell. And as David mentioned about two weeks ago, um, Hell. Many people do not talk about them. We focus on the good, and that's what people like. That's what brings in the crowds. But we talk about the consequence of sin and its penalty. So most people not like it, but it's very necessary because it is a real place. So it says, "Those who sin will be cast into hell." In Psalm chapter 1, verse 6, it says, For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the godly shall perish. In Psalm chapter 9, verse 17, it says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Hell is described as punishment, pain, or torment. Luke chapter, Luke chapter 16, verse 1 through 24, says, And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off. And Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and pull my tongue, for I am tormented in this one. Described as everlasting fire. Matthew 25, verse 41. Then shall he also, then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you be cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Described as God taking vengeance, tribulation, fire, punishment, and separation from God. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6 through 9, it says, Seeing it is a righteous thing of God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you that who are troubled rest with us. And the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We shall be punished with everlasting destruction in the presence of the Lord from the glory of His power. Described as corruption in Galatians chapter 6 and 8, it says, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall reap, shall of the Spirit reap and with life everlasting. Described as an outer darkness. In Matthew 25 and verse 30, it says, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping, weeping, and gnashing teeth. In Matthew 20, 25, oh, sorry, the quote. It describes no rest. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 10 and 11, it says, And the same shall drink of the wine of the, of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture to the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. It's also awful because sin caused crucifixion, man's sin, thus serving, this, thus deserving death. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans chapter Chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, the gift of God, eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 and 4, says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of the thing, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year to year continually make the corner of their answer perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worships of worshipers once purged should have no have had, had no more contents of sins? But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance, again, made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of those should take away the sins. Second Corinthians chapter 5 to 21 reads, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And this is a bit of a long one. It says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of, God, of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root of, out of a, bri- of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should, that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief, and we hid it as it were our faces from him. He is despised, and we esteem him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, and carried out our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastening of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes he were our healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears, shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall de- and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. This impression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify men, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion to the grave, and he shall divide the spoil of the strong. He had poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with transgressors, and he bare the sin of men, and made intercession for the transgression. And perhaps why sin is truly awful is that it separates man from God, because God is holy. God does not hear the, un- the unjust, the unrighteous. And so without Christ, we would not be here, be heard, because we are unrighteous, we are unholy. And so Christ become hol- becomes holiness for us. He becomes an intercessor for us, that, that God may hear our prayers. It is not a man that intercedes for us to hear our prayers, because man is corruptible. And so it is Christ that has been made holy for us, that God may hear our prayers. It says God is holy. In Psalm chapter 111, verse 9, it says, And he, he sent redemption unto his people, yet commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverent is his name. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, In one prior unto another, he said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Being holy, God has no sin. In chapter 1, verse 17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the, fathers, from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow or of turning. And in first John chapter fifth chapter one verse five, this is then is the message which we have heard from and declared unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God cannot be associated with sin. In Psalm chapter five, verse four, it reads, For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, 
Neither shall evil dwell with thee. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that he cannot save. Neither his ears, his ear has it, that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hindered his face from you, that he will not hear. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. The result, seminary, enmity, enmity between God and man. Psalm chapter 5, verse 5 and 6 says, But foolish shall not stand in thy son, thou gavest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak, that speak least, leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. James chapter 4, verse 4, Ye adulterers and adulterers, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. 1 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 11, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor nor adulterers, nor feminine, nor abusers of themselves and mankind. Neither thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revivers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. As such were some of you, ye are washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. The awfulness of, of sin and its consequences help us to understand the point of what he means to God. And this is the main point that I wish to make today, is that the awfulness of sin and its consequences must show us that we ought to render a bit of obedience, that we ought to repent of our sins. In Romans chapter 6, verse 22, verse 23, But now being made free from sin, and becoming servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness. In the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55 to 57 says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 18 and 24 is, Any man called being circumcised, let him not be uncircumcised. If any called in uncircumcision, let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling where he was called. Art thou called being a servant, care not up for it, but if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant, the Lord is free man. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. If you are bought with Christ, be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man, wherein he is called, there and abide with God. First John chapter 1 and 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. In the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, Saint, cleanses us from all sin. Conclusion of this, sin is an awful thing in the world. The more people were aware of the depths of sin and its price and consequences, there would be much less sin, in our, much less evil in our world today. God, who has called people today, has brought a remedy for our sins through Jesus Christ, a remedy only offered by His great sacrifice. If you believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had of your sins, that's His name before now. Be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins as we stand and sing. Thank <laughs> you.